Harrowick County is a pretty rural place, all things considered. Most of its residents, myself included, live in the county seat of Sombermory. It's a decent sized college town, one that could generously be described as a small city. It's surrounded by farmland and backwoods, like most places in southern Ontario. But the further north you go, the more you're pushing into the great Canadian wilderness. There are a few small towns and hamlets besides Sombermory, and some cottages around Samner Lake. But once you go past that, it's pretty sparsely populated. But there are still people who live up there, including a small community that the rest of our county has taken to calling Mennonites. Either as a simplification or a euphemism, but they're not Mennonites. They're very insular, periodically venturing out to nearby towns for certain amenities, but only very rarely making their way as far south to the comparative metropolis of Sombermore. There's an unspoken rule not to engage with them unless we have to. Just give them a white berth and let them go about their business. It was a rule I was happy to abide by. But then, I walked into my boss's office and saw one of their children sitting across from him. She was nine, maybe ten years old. Her hair was jet black with multiple braided strands and she was dressed in a dark red homespun robes with a white hood. Despite her youth, her face and hands were covered in dark tattoos that looked like Viking or Celtic war paint, including a rippling stripe right across her eyes. I reflexively froze in my tracks and just stared at her, an action I instantly regretted when I saw her eyes go wide in fear at the sight of me. Perfect timing, Miss Romero. I have someone I'd like you to meet. My boss said, tactfully breaking the silence without drawing attention to it. This is Ellie Faye. Her family are uh, acquaintances of mine, and I was doing them a favor by giving her a checkup. Her community is very particular about which outsiders they let do these sort of things. I work for a company called Thorn Tech. It's a private research lab, not a medical clinic. So my boss's explanation for why this girl was here didn't quite add up. But it wasn't completely unreasonable either, and I knew from experience not to press my boss about these sort of things. Her community? She's... I began. One of the local Mennonites, yes. He cut me off. I'm going to need you to give her a ride home. Straight home. You understand? No stops. I understand, Dr. Thorne. I nodded. Good. Elifay here knows the way. Follow her directions precisely, and don't attempt to use GPS or anything like that. It won't do you any good. He claimed. He took a small wooden box from his desk and handed it to the girl. Goodbye, Elifay. You are a very good girl today, and your family will be proud. You'll be sure to give this to your mother, yes? The girl nodded emphatically and murmured a heartfelt thank you as she clutched the box protectively to her chest, scurrying out of the room and towards the parking lot. Chocolates, he said to me, noticing my curious expression. You best be going after her then, and feel free to stay a while if they offer. We can't be insulting their hospitality now, can we? Of course not, Dr. Thorne. I promised as I set off to catch up to Alifay. I followed her out into the parking lot, where I found her anxiously waiting by my company car. Presumably, my boss had told her which car would be taking her home before I came into the room. I took out my keys and unlocked it for her. But I didn't realize that the sudden sound of the car unlocking by itself would startle her. Oh god, I'm sorry sweetie, that was just me. I apologized, holding up the keys for her to see. She didn't acknowledge me. She just threw open the passenger door and slammed it shut the instant she was inside. Lock it, she commanded as soon as I was in the driver's seat. She was still clutching the box of chocolates to her chest like it was the most precious thing in the world. I nodded understandingly and locked the car. So, 
Just hit north down the highway until you tell me different? I asked her. She nodded vigorously, but said nothing. Sure. My name's Rosalind, by the way. You can call me Rose, though, if you like. Um, can you just buckle your seatbelt, please? It's for your own safety. She looked confused for a second. So I pulled at my own seatbelt to illustrate what I was talking about. She glanced at the seatbelt to her side, and then down at her box, obviously reluctant to let it go even for a moment. I could buckle it for you if you like, I offered. She shook her head fiercely, and I let out a slight sigh. How about then, I get back out of the car, stand back away, and let you buckle yourself. Okay, she agreed softly. I nodded, briefly demonstrating how to buck herself in with my own seatbelt before stepping out of the car. I locked her in again and stepped back until she felt comfortable enough to put the box down. It took a few tries to get the buckle to work, but she snatched up the box again as soon as her hands were free. I smiled and slid back into the driver's seat. Thank you, she said softly. No problem, kid, I said as I turned the key to the ignition. So, is this your first time outside of your community? By myself, yes, she murmured. She was keeping her head low, avoiding looking not only at me, but outside. I felt sorry for her, since she was clearly overwhelmed at being so far outside her comfort zone. I see. Can I ask why you are by yourself? How did you even get here? I asked. It's part of the ritual. The offering has to be retrieved by a young girl by herself, so that there's no possibility of it being taken by force. It's so important to us, and it's too tempting for grown-ups just to take it. That's how my grandfather died. He gets very angry with us when we don't get it honestly. She replied cryptically. And there's a shuttle that stops at Harris Hollow that comes into Summer Moray. But the bus stop is downtown. I had to cross the bridge and walk all the way down Napoleon Avenue just to get here. I can't do that again. Not with this. Yeah, no worries, kid. I'll get you home. I tried to assuage her as gently as I could. Do north towards Harris Hollow and you'll tell me when to turn, okay? She nodded again, but still didn't look up. I took us out of the parking lot and headed east down Alchemy Street towards the highway, since that was the fastest way out of town, and Ellie Faye obviously wasn't in the mood for sightseeing. As I drove, I started feeling a little conflicted about taking her home to what I realized might be a very abusive cult. I didn't really know anything about them, but they had tattooed a pre-adolescent girl's face presumably to limit her options of ever seeking a life outside of a community. Out of concern for her, and honestly, just plain curiosity, I decided to pry a little bit. So, Elife, does everyone in your community have tattoos like yours? I asked. No, everyone's are special, she told me. But everyone has tattoos though? Even the kids? I asked, and she gently nodded in the affirmative. How old were you when you got your tattoos? We can earn our first tattoos as early as five, if we're brave enough, which I was, she explained. Well, you're definitely brave, Elife, coming out here all by yourself, I told her. You must love your community very much to do this for them. Again. She just quietly nodded. Do they take good care of you out there? I asked as tactfully as I could. You said something about someone getting very angry when you don't do things honestly. Do people in your community hurt you when you do things they think are bad? To my relief, she shook her head dismissively at the question. I didn't sense any fear or duplicity in her reaction. No. It's safe there, and this is going to keep us safe, she said, squeezing the box slightly tighter. 
This was when my curiosity started shifting towards what the hell was in that box. What could my boss give these people that they could care about so much and that they would use in a ritual to keep them safe and that could fit into a small box? Medicine was the most logical thing I could think of, but it still seemed so damn weird. Mind if I ask a bit more about this ritual you mentioned? I asked casually. Why couldn't my boss have brought that to you? I had to come to his lap so he could take my blood. She explained. Your blood? For tests. He says that our village shows a pronounced founder effect and genetic bottleneck that he finds fascinating. She continued. I also gave him some spit, answered some questions, and stood inside some machines that saw inside me. That was the scariest. The blood hurt more, but he gave me juice and cookies afterwards. I didn't take them, since I thought he was trying to trick me into taking them instead of the offering. But he promised he wasn't. He said it was customary to get juice and cookies after giving blood, especially when you're small and don't have much blood to spare to begin with. That's because you need extra fluids and nutrients to help replace the blood you lost, I told her. So my boss is doing research on your village in exchange for whatever's in that box? It's a good deal. We don't have much else of value to offer anyone else. Which is why we go to him, she said. She looked up slightly as we went by the wind farm outside of town. The shadows from the wind turbines and spinning plates sliced across the highway over and over again, causing Ellie Faye to recoil in her seat. It's okay, sweetie. I know the wind turbines look pretty big up close. I try to comfort her. Did you know that your blades can be over a hundred meters long? I know they can be a little eerie to look at. Something the size of a skyscraper moving around so effortlessly. But they're good though. They and the hydro station are how we make our electricity without any pollution. You can't see him, can you? She asked solemnly keeping her head down as much as possible. See him? Who? I asked. He's already here, one foot in this world, standing among the windmills, she muttered. He knows I have it. He wants it. He's looking right at me. Sweetie, there's nothing out there. The wind turbines are just strange to you, and you're imagining things. I assured her. Have you ever read Don Quixote? He thought windmills were giants too. She didn't respond. She just kept her head down with her eyes squinted shut, holding onto that box for dear life. She didn't say much after that until we were within sight of Harris Hollow and she told me to turn down a side road. I followed that for a few miles, until she told me to turn down an unmarked dirt road that ran through a heavily forested area. Here, here, stop here, she ordered after only a few minutes of driving. I pulled over to the side of the road, even though I didn't see anything worth stopping for. With one hand still on the box, she used the other one to unbuckle herself and then opened the door, dashing out and sprinting off into the woods. Mama! Whoa, kid, get back here, I shouted as I gave chase to her. When I reached the forest's edge, I saw that she had gone down a trail that was completely camouflaged by the road. I ran down it, just barely catching up to Alife, until coming out on the other side into an enormous clearing. There, I saw dozens of beehive-shaped, house-sized structures that looked like they had been woven and cultivated from living plant matter each surrounded by large vegetable gardens. There were a handful of more conventional buildings in a state of disrepair, but held together by the same living plant matter that made up the rest of the buildings. There were acres of fruit trees and wheat fields near the border of the clearing, and a number of dogs, cats, goats, and chickens that seemed to have free run of the place. And of course, there were hundreds of Mennonites like Elife, dressed in the same homespun robes and adorned in the same style of tattoos. 
they were similar in appearance to Elifei as well, pretty much all of them looking like they could be our relatives. That fit with what my boss had said about them having a pronounced founder effect and genetic bottleneck. But the odd thing was that I didn't see any immediate obvious adverse effects from inbreeding. They were quite attractive actually, all of them tall and hale, with no apparent health issues in sight. Elifei! A woman shouted as she ran to embrace the child. Elifei tried to present the box to her, but the woman just hugged and kissed her, overjoyed at her return and not giving a damn and not giving a damn about what was in that box. That made me feel a lot better about bringing her back home. Mama, I did it, I did it, Elifei said as tears of relief and pride rolled down her cheeks. A crowd had formed around her now and she held up the box for them to see. I still couldn't see what was inside it, but the rest of the villagers burst out into cheers and applause. A man who I presumed to be Elifei's father hoisted her up onto her shoulder and began to parade her around the village to her adoring crowd. Her mother didn't follow them though, but rather came over to greet me. Thank you, she smiled gratefully, tears still wet on her cheeks. I'm Chrysella. Elifei's mother, as you probably guessed. Thank you so much for bringing her home. I was so worried about her. I would have gone with her if I could have. But... Yeah, hey, no worries. She is not that young. A day trip by herself isn't that weird. I'm sure you're an amazing mother to her. I assured her. I'm Rosalind, by the way. I work for Dr. Thorne. I know. He said you'd probably be the one who'll be bringing her home. She said. Now that we have that stupid thing, we'll be having the ritual tonight. You're welcome to stay, if you don't mind me chaperoning you. I'll make sure you don't do anything you're not supposed to, and I promise not to let any harm come to you as a reward for bringing Alifei home. I was, admittedly, a bit reluctant to accept the offer. Spending an evening alone with an isolationist cult I knew next to nothing about and miles away from any possible help wasn't my first choice for a good time. But Dr. Thorne had insisted I accept their hospitality, and Chrysella seemed sincere in her gratitude. So, I decided I could trust her. Plus, I really did want to know what was in that box. Chrysella gave me a brief tour of the village as some of the others went about setting up for a big bonfire and erecting maypoles wreathed in garlands. Smoke began rising from some of the structures as the evening feast, as the evening feast was being prepared and some smaller cooking fires had been set up outdoors to accommodate the extra food. Tables and chairs were brought outside, and barrels of ciders were rolled out, and Elifei was walking around with a big wicker basket full of garlands that she was handing out to the women. She was all smiles and excitement, and it was so nice to see her like that after she had been so quiet and anxious the whole afternoon. And during the tour, I made an attempt to inquire about how long the village had been here, how they made their strange buildings, and what exactly their beliefs were, but Chrysella managed to avoid giving me a direct answer to any of it. What about this ritual then? I pressed her. Elifei said it was to keep you safe. Safe from what? And how does it do that? You'll see for yourself soon enough, she promised with a weak smile. Our conversation was ended by someone blowing a long horn, which was apparently the signal that it was time for the feast to begin. At the head of the longest table was an elderly man who I took to be their leader, and Elifei was proudly seated at his right hand in recognition of her success in procuring their offering. All of the meat was game, venison, rabbits, and wild turkey, which I guessed was because their domestic animals were worth more to them alive. Chrysella explained to me that everything but the desserts had been made with what they grew, hunted, or forged for themselves, as they took great pride in being entirely self-sufficient in terms of necessities. Well, most necessities, I suppose, she added with a downward glance. As the sun began to set, some blinking red lights in the distance above the tree line caught my attention and left me faintly unsettled. They were 
wind turbines. I had thought that Elifei had imagined the monster in the wind turbines earlier because they had been unfamiliar to her. But it seemed now that wasn't the case. Once the feast was over, the bonfire was lit and some of the villagers began singing or playing instruments. Elifei ran up to me and insisted I join her in a maypole dance and I happily obliged her. The partying went on until twilight had faded to true night, and that's when things took on a much more serious tone. Everyone gathered around the bonfire, bowed their heads, and began to chant in low voices. I couldn't really make out what they were saying, but I'm not sure if that's because they were speaking another language, or because I had gotten a little hammered on the apple cider. The old man from before lifted Elifei up onto an elevator wicker throne, and I saw that she once again had the box clutched tightly in her hands. She stood rather than sat upon it, looking far off into the distance with a terrified expression on her face. I followed her gaze to see what she was looking at, seeing nothing but the blinking red lights of the wind turbines. I'm not sure if it's because I was drunk or it was something else entirely. But it took me a lot longer than I should have to realize that one of the lights was much closer than the others. And it was getting closer. The light popped up and down as it moved towards us, dimly illuminating a spindly yet colossal humanoid form beneath it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I just stared at it in dumb uncomprehending horror. Fleeing would have been futile, but I wasn't thinking rationally. I was just petrified. And the giant strode into the village, coming to a stop by the bonfire, allowing me to get a decent look at it. Its lanky body was covered in dull, fierce scales, and the spaces between them infested with a heavy, furry fungal growth. Its neck was long, its head was round, and where its face should have been, there was only a gaping orifice that held the red light I had seen from afar. It wasn't blinking now, but instead glowed steadily and brightly to illuminate the crowd beneath it. The giant squatted down on its knees to get a closer look at us. It cocked its head slightly when its light passed over me noting the presence of an outsider, but thankfully not caring. Its focus quickly shifted towards Elifei, trembling in fear but still standing upon the throne and holding out her offering. Oh, luminous, effulgent one, thank you for heeding our prayer. She stammered, her cracking voice barely more than a whisper. We thank you for the blessings we have received and beseech you for your blessing once again. Please, keep our village safe and bountiful, its people healthy and free. I offer you this token of our piety, a once ephemeral living thing turned to imperishable stone from the ancient depths of time and freed from its rest of countless ions to provide a moment's whimsy for your eternal being. I, a girl who has not yet had her first moon time, ventured out alone and retrieved it in good faith with no wrongdoing as a sign of our faith in your protection and devotion to the ethos you command of us. She opened the box, and I was finally able to see what was inside of it. It was a trilobite fossil. Interesting, but nothing too spectacular, and obviously not something that would be easy for such a reclusive community to come by, but not impossible either. A reasonable sacrifice all in all. Elifei held out the little stone arthropod, and the giant, the god, whatever it was, reached down and pinched it between its spidery fingers like it was a grain of sand. It held it up to inspect it for a moment, possibly just for show as I had a hard time believing it actually gave a damn about it. And then, gave an approving nod. With its remaining hand, it gave Elifei an affectionate pat on the head, then rose back to its full height.
the light within its head began to flicker and hum. And with little warning, it exploded into a blinding flash. Its body vanished into the ether. But the sparkles of light wafted down upon everyone and everything in the village, including me. There was an immediate tone shift amongst the crowd as the summer chanting switched to victorious cheering. The village elder began pontificating. An overwhelmed Elifei was being attended by a frantic mother. And I... I passed out. I woke up with a mild hangover in my company car the next morning. I wasn't in the woods anymore either. The autopilot having taken me as far as it could on its own. A gas station on the outskirts of Harris Hollow. I was pretty disoriented. And my first impulse was to dismiss what had happened as a dream. But then, I got a glimpse of myself in the rearview mirror. And I saw I was still wearing the garland that Elifrey had given me. Beside me, in the passenger seat, was a small wicker basket filled with leftovers from the previous night's feast, along with a handwritten note. Cautiously, reluctantly, I picked it up and read it. Dear Rose, Thank you so much for bringing me home. Mama was so proud of me for being so brave, and I was able to keep our whole village safe thanks to you. I'm sorry for not telling you about the effulgent one, but we're not supposed to talk about him to people who haven't seen him. I know he's scary, like the windmills, but just like them, he's how we survive without causing needless harm. Our village has been blessed by his light again, and now you're blessed too. Tell Dr. Thorne we're thankful for his help again as well, and you can tell him about the effulgent one. He already knows, and the effulgent one doesn't like it when we lie about him. You'll be able to see him now, next time he comes. So, keep an eye on the windmills. They might be giants. I hope I see you again before then though. Please, come visit soon. Yours truly. Elifei.